I said, uh, just what you said earlier, you know, go home to this father and be sexually abused. I said, who would be harder to forgive? The mother. Because she wouldn't put a stop to it. You see, if that man beat up his woman wife, and you can justify, it's my wife, I can do with her what I want to. I said, what if she beat up another woman in your church? Would, would you tolerate that? Well, of course not. It's all right to do his own wife. It's not only wrong, it's double wrong. That man was charged by God to provide and protect. So she's not only getting abused, but she's getting abused by the one who was supposed to provide and protect. So she's losing that too. I submit to his double loss. If a woman abuses her own kids at home, that's okay. And then she starts abusing kids in your nursery and you tolerate that? Of course she wouldn't. But it's all right to do it to her own children. It's double loss. The kids have nobody to go to now. The provision and protection, they're losing that, plus they're getting abused. It's actually a double loss. And, and really, I think if the church is responsible, we step in and say, no more. No more. Not because I hate you. Frankly, I think it's the act of love at that time to step in and say, I'm going to stop you before you kill and destroy your family. You can see I'm a little passionate about this. <laughs> well, if you sat where I have for years and heard these abuse stories and, and seen them cry out for help and get none, folks, that is absolutely maddening to me after a while. And a lot of these have gone to people for help. I remember a gal came up and said, oh, I know who to forgive my mother. Well, I could forgive her tonight, but I'm going to go to her house next week. And she's going to badmouth me again, put me down again. I said, put a stop to it. I mean, she was almost shocked at my response. Well, aren't I supposed to honor my mother and my father? I said, how would that honor your mother to allow her to systematically now destroy your present family and you? Is that honoring her? Hey, by the way, for what it's worth, to honor mother and father in the Old Testament probably means financially take care of your aging parents. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be submissive. That's not the point. But here's my real point. I'm saying, listen, your mom and dad gave you away. Your primary responsibility right now is not to your mother and your father, it's to your husband and your children before God. What do you suggest I do? I suggest you go over there next Sunday. And, uh, and out of respect, if she invites you to come. But if she does that, say, Mom, what you're doing right now is wrong. And I'm not going to put up with this anymore. And, and you need some help. And I'm going to have to stay away to make sure that I don't pass this on to the next generation. And if she won't tolerate that, then get out of there. I said, you have every right to put the scriptural boundaries to stop that kind of abuse. You know, I talked to a 40-year-old lady. Everything she buys in her home is still with the thought, would mom approve? And she's holding this big heritage. Now, her brother had walked away from this a long time ago, and she disherited him. But there was no way he was going to allow this woman to continue to control her life that way. And uh, it was her husband who brought this to my attention. She said, I've got a, two women in my house. I've got my wife I try to live with and sleep with, and I got this. I won't say what he said. <laughs> um, so we sat down. I said, do you want to live this way? you want to still somehow or another try to seek mom's approval? You may never get it, by the way. You can go the rest of your life, probably never get it. And let her control your life, control your family this way? No, I don't want that. Well, she sat down and wrote her mother a letter, respectfully. Mom, I love you. Thank you for all the things you've done for me. But uh, my responsibility right now is to my husband and my children, and this is going to stop. She, she disherited him. The mother totally cut off for two years. And she realized, I'm all alone. And uh, finally came to her. But you see, she not only had a right to do that, I think she has a responsibility to her own kids, to her own marriage right now. And, and, and in the long run, that kind of tough love is the only way that you're going to help this, get this person get some help. And so forgiveness is not tolerating sin. It's not seeking resentment. Well, I just want the sole satisfaction of hating the wretch. Ah, you lose, see. Uh, you're just putting yourself on the same level with them. Well, I want revenge. What does Scripture say? Revenge is mine. I will pay, saith the Lord. 
Now here's, here's where it's an interesting issue because where is the justice in this thing? You know, I want justice. Settle something now, honestly. Wherever Christianity has flourished, social justice has been considerably elevated. That's true. But you will never have perfect justice in this lifetime. And if, if the last famous trials in our country for the last five, ten years haven't revealed that to you, I don't know what will. You will not have it. Should we work for it? Yes. Will you have it? No. That's why there's a final judgment someday. God will make this thing right in the end. You've got to trust God that he is the avenger. And uh, you've got to trust that. You've got to believe that. And he'll do it justly and rightly. Something we can't totally capable of doing. Illustration. I was in California. Uh, engineer. was married. Five kids. Nice wife. Nice family. Started an affair. Wife found out about it. Premeditated murder, folks. He, she called this young gal to meet with her. Took a gun and shot her. And that gal's dead. She's serving a life term. And not a law in our land that can touch that husband. And you call that justice? What would have happened to him in the Old Testament? He'd been stoned to death. <laughs> no, you won't have perfect justice in this life. Should we work for it? Sure. But, but that's why there's a final judgment. That's why God will, will sort this out. See, the beautiful part about this is if I let God do that, then I don't have to. What's to be gained in this is freedom. And you say, well, I've got to heal first and I'll forgive. You won't get there. You forgive in order to heal. The healing comes after the forgiveness. It comes as part of the freedom that comes with you. Uh, otherwise, it's going to sit there and fester and fester and fester and fester and fester. It's, uh... Now, here's the key. If you're going to forgive as Jesus forgave you, how did he do that? He took your sin upon himself. Essentially, all forgiveness is efficacious. Uh, to put it in a practical way, what it means is if you're making a decision to forgive, and that's what it is, you are agreeing to live with the consequences of that person's sin. You say, well, that's not fair. Actually, it isn't. But truth of the matter is, you'll have to anyhow. Think about that. Everybody here is living with the consequences of somebody else's sin. Every one of you are. Me too. Actually, every person in this room right now is living with the consequences of Adam's sin. The only real choice that we have is to do that in the bondage or bitterness or the freedom of forgiveness. That's the only real choice that we have. You can hang on to the bitterness, but the only one you're actually hurting is yourself. Well, you can hurt them and seek revenge too, but the point of it is... As long as you hang on to the bitterness, the only one you hurt is yourself. Or you can choose the freedom of forgiveness. Lord, I forgive. Now, how do you do that from your heart? Because on the passage on 70 times 7, he adds a new qualification from your heart. From your heart. Now, this is a tough one. And if there is a, a pastoral skill that you develop over time, this, this is probably one this is tough to help a person legitimately work through this, folks. I mean, I'll be honest with you. Uh, some of it's kind of mechanical what we teach you, but, but this is a very important issue. And uh, you've got to forgive from your heart. If you forgive generically, you get generic freedom. And you talk to some people, well, I forgave my dad, you know. That's great. What for? You know, things he did to me. What did he do to you? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> See, they haven't forgiven uh, the only way I know how it, 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 to help a person really work through this, and this is all in the context of counseling now, but when, what we do, and we'll show you a little later, is we'll have them pray and ask the Lord who they need to forgive. Now, if you've never done this before, it's amazing. God shows them. I mean, even in the face of denial, I've had people look at me and say, well, there's nobody. I said, would you just share names not coming to your mind? <laughs> Thirty names come out, and we spend the next hour working through it. And, uh, but we talk about it. Now, no detail. That all comes out in the process. But they just list names. 95% of the time, the first two people mentioned are mom and dad. Now, it's not that they're the most offensive people in the world, but they are the key significant others in their history, aren't they? And, um, but 95% of the time, and usually the top five are family members, okay? 
And, uh, but uh, when I'm done, I'll, I write on the top. I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm making the list. I'm just putting numbers, making the list, and they're sharing me names. I'm going down. Meanwhile, I'm writing up here, Lord, I forgive, but a blank, what for? And, uh, and then I'll stop and I'll explain to them, or ask them usually, if you forgave these people, what would you be doing? I wanted to know where they're coming from, what that would mean to them, the decision they're making. And usually it's going to be wrong, to be honest with you. They don't know. They haven't thought much about it. Uh, and then, so we take some time. Now, in the steps, key points are highlighted even. And we make sure we go over that because I, this is an informed decision that they're making. They need to know what they're doing. They really do. Um, and, and it is a crisis of the will. And the obvious example of that is our Lord, you know. It was a struggle. Lord, if it be thy will, remove this cup from me. And finally, third time, nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done. And dear Christian, that's where the battle was, was won, right there. From that point on, the decision was made. The rest was just dutifully following it out and going to that cross, despising the shame and enduring the suffering. But the decision was made right there. That one decision changed the scope of eternity for all of us. And uh, I said, are you willing to let these people go, to walk out of here free? It's your choice. Or walk out of here in bitterness. And, uh, and for some, it's a very emotional experience. Now, you've got to be careful here. It requires some discernment. Not everybody expresses their emotions the same. I mean, you can walk into a room and share some great news, man. And some will go, Whoa! And others will go, oh, that's good. Then my wife will probably start crying. And uh, <laughs> why are you crying? I'm so happy. Don't they? Anyway, I mean, and, and so you get some people who are really, you know, em truly emotionally connect and, and just keep handing them hankies. And, and others, I remember one gal in particular. I mean, she was a lawyer. <laughs> But she was making decisions. There's no question about it. And she knew what that decision was, and she was struggling with it. You know, there was, she was, she, she processed it incredibly well. And she walked out free, and her whole countenance changed. And uh, we're going to show you a counseling session either, probably in two weeks. A gal go from clinical depression to freedom in two hours. You, that, that's going to be our class time. You'll see the process. And uh, as you watch it, watch her face change, because she comes in depressed. She leaves no depression. Well, you can just see the cloud lift as she goes through it, but the big one was forgiveness. And um, so I'll, I'll show you that. One picture's worth a thousand words. And, and um, I was 12 years old. I had more hair. Uh, <laughs> but that was the first time I actually realized I had a bald spot. Men don't look in the back of their heads. I know you gals do, but I don't. And when I saw that video, I was like, for crying out loud, somebody cut a hole in the back of my head, you know? <laughs> Uh, so anyway, uh, what we do, and that is something, and for some it's very effective. Lord, I forgive my father, and I tell him, stay with that person till every member of pain, every hurt, and whatever God brings to mind. Now, there's two things that happen here. Some people will put names down that they're surprised. I don't know why this name is in my mind. I said, put it down. When you get there, you'll know. And during the process itself, God brings back old memories. I've seen some people really come to terms with things they've tried to bury for years. And the problem is we try to bury it, but you bury it alive. You don't bury it dead. And let me hear my heart on this, folks. God's been trying to surface this thing for years. That's why, you, that's why you, this mental torment is here, why you can't sleep at night. He's been trying to surface it. Humanly, what do we try to do? Suppress it. He's trying to surface it. So you let it go. And uh, Lord, I forgive my father because what he did to me made me feel this way. He always put me down and made me feel worthless, unloved. What I'm trying to do, if you're going to forgive from your heart, you've got to get down to the emotional core, because that's where the healing is going to take place. And if you don't allow that to go to yourself there, I said, uh, truth of the matter is you're just you're skating over it. It's a great evangelical slide over, you know. Well, I forgive my father, you know. For what? What did he do? I'm not that 
And I said, if you face this successfully one time, it's over. And what's to be gained is freedom. I'll tell you how dramatic I've seen this. Because I'll never start this process and not finish it with somebody. It may take a while. I remember a gal had to take a break halfway through her list. The big ones are always out on the top. They come up first. And, um, and she came back in and she picked up the list again and looked at it. She said, why do the names at the top look different to me now than the names at the bottom? That's how dramatic it was. Remember that primary emotion? Didn't want to talk about that person. Didn't want to think about them. All of a sudden, she could look at that name and not have an emotional reaction to it. That was the most vivid thing. I wish I had photographed that because when she became aware of that herself, I said, she, for the first time, realized she was free from them, from those people. They didn't have a hold on her anymore. Does she like them now? No, that's not the point. You don't play with your emotions like that. You know, people in Germany needed to forgive Hitler. Did they like him afterwards? You don't like evil, you know, or sick things like that. This is not a game that we're playing with our emotions or, or trying to pretend to somebody everything is okay now. It's not. It's what's to be gained here is to get back again to the source of life ourself. For the one who can heal me. For the one who can set me free. But if bitterness is between me and my father, I said, see, by the way, this is worth bringing up. Very confusing for a lot of people. The Sermon on the Mount says, if you go to church, remember your brother has something against you, what should you do? Leave your offering and go be reconciled. Now, careful now. That's if the Holy Spirit brings to your conviction that you've hurt or offended somebody else. What should you do? Don't go to God. Go to that person. Seek their forgiveness. Make retribution if it's necessary. You know, go be reconciled. You know, you're at fault. Go ask their forgiveness. Now, if you've done that and they don't forgive you, what more do you need to do? Actually, nothing. You've done what God has required of you. They may not. And I said, but you've done all God has required of you. And, and, and the Bible says, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. It doesn't always depend on you. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that you're going to find in helping people forgive and get free from their past, forgiveness is always an issue. And many, many times they, they are so confused in their mind, they think if I forgave this person, I'd have to go to them. Not true. What we're dealing with here is your need to forgive somebody else who's hurt you. In such a case, don't go to them. Go to God. And you've got to draw a line. You can, these could be the same two people you're talking about, but it's two different activities. If you got free with God, he may convict you, and, and they leave that session. They may go out and seek uh, you know, reconciliation with a person that they've offended. That may happen afterwards. But hear me, this is really interesting. Your freedom cannot be dependent upon that other person. That's right. That's right. And, uh, and you can be responsible for God and get right with God regardless of what that other person does or doesn't do. And the reason this is so critical is, is that many times you're going to deal with people who need to forgive somebody who's dead. And frankly, somebody you don't want them reconciled with. What if you're getting somebody out of Satanism? You want to go be reconciled to a, a witch? No. Because that's not dependent upon you. Now, if that witch came to you and said, what happened to you? And they want to come to Christ, then you can be. See, what's interesting about that is, a reconciliation for us means that you have removed the enmity between two parties. Had to happen here. The enmity was our sin. And so God dealt with that. Did God need to repent? No. But he did need to forgive. He had to find a means for us to, to be forgiven in order for us to be reconciled with him. Now when we work it this way, I can tell you right now, if reconciliation is true, repentance and forgiveness has to happen probably on both sides. Can you have reconciliation without repentance? No. You can have conciliation. You can have peacekeeping, but not true reconciliation. But that's the point, as far as it depends on you be at peace with all men. But if that person doesn't want to be reconciled with you, can you be? No. No, not really. Uh, does God hold you guilty for that, though? If you admit, no. No, you're free. Get on with your life. 
That's why you can solve that sitting right here. Because it's primarily between you and God. Your need to forgive that other person initially is not an issue between you and that other person. It's an issue between you and your Heavenly Father. And the reason that God will turn you over the tormentors is not because he's vindictive or, or, or judging. It is a disciplinary act, I believe, because he doesn't want you to live in bitterness. Because he wants you to let it go. And walk out of here free. And you can. You can. Any questions on forgiveness? Anything that I haven't covered here that's very important for you? If, not, if you think about something this week, it's fair to bring it up next week. There is not one issue more important in ministry than this. Not one. Not one. Uh, I, I just can't even think of a person that I've tried to help in the past, or, or help myself for that matter, where forgiveness isn't an issue. Either knowing myself I'm forgiven by God, for instance, or that I've been willing to forgive others or, or to seek forgiveness. I mean, this all ties in to the great commandment. To love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and mind. The second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you've done that, how much have you done? All. The law and the prophets. What's the purpose for the book? It's to govern your relationship with God and man. And to, to do ministry without that in mind, without falling in love with God, and if that was successful, you'd fall in love with his people. It, it all starts here. And so to do ministry and to bypass forgiveness, it isn't going to be ministry anymore. It isn't going to be ministry. This is to be running programs. Well, people languish in bitterness. And many will be defiled. Uh, you heard the story of Corey Tebboom, I'm sure. You know, went around afterwards in Germany, was sitting in church one Sunday morning preaching about forgiveness, about God's love. And when she concluded the service, people came up to greet her. And the man stuck out his hands. Ja, Fräulein Tebboom, isn't it good that God forgives? And she recognized him. It was a guard. Then looked upon her naked body and poked fun at her. She froze, shocked at her own response. And then by the grace of God, she reached out and took his hand and set him both free. You know, the first time I met Dale, we were at it was a prayer thing here, and he came up and uh, he said, you got to meet somebody. And uh, I said, who? Well, it turned out we did. About two months later, it was the most amazing thing. So he said, this woman is using your ministry. She lives in Stockholm, Sweden. And, uh, uh, and she's using your ministry all over uh, Ukraine and Eastern Europe. And I said, really? And, uh, and it turned out that she was flying into Nashville here, and the guy, the, a missionary, came up to meet her. Hitler was her godfather. I mean, when I first heard that. I said, come on, really? I, well, first of all, I went, how old is she? <laughs> well, she is in her 70s. And, uh, but she's got a little book, and I read it. Uh, it was poorly translated, but it's readable, of her story. And uh, her father <clears throat> was the top military official at the 76 Olympic Games. He was Hitler's top man and was in charge of security for the 76 Olympics. And, uh, but he was also a godly man and started to have more and more trouble with anti-Semitism and the things that were rising. And he started to speak out against it. <clears throat> and the SS came and gave him a pill and said, you can uh, do this and honor your name and we'll give you an honorary funeral and we'll call it a heart attack. And, and uh, for the sake of his family, he took the pill and died. His daughter didn't know that at that time. 
<clears throat> found that out later. The mother acknowledged the whole thing. And, and then they went through the whole war. <clears throat> and obviously, the need to forgive Hitler and the Gestapo and all that kind of stuff was critical. But her hardest was to forgive the Russians, who swept in and raped and pillaged and uh, just carnage. I mean, now you probably don't hear that much about after the war, but brutal. 20 million Russians died in World War II. Five million of them by friendly fire. They shot their own. Isn't that mind-boggling to you? But her hatred for the, the Russians uh, of the pillaging that went afterwards and the destruction and, you know, out of their own hatred themselves came in. So who's her ministry to today? The Russians. Isn't that the grace of God? To turn your heart around so much that the, the one that you couldn't let go suddenly becomes the one you help. That's the gospel, folks. That's the gospel. Let's pray. Lord, help us to see. Open our eyes. To know your love to know your forgiveness, to realize the depth that we have been forgiven so that we can love others. And Father, we just want to be an instrument in your hand, but we need to see that. We need to understand it, and we need to let it go ourselves. Not to hang on to the past and, and the offenses and the bitterness, but to grab hold of you and allow you to set us free. God, that's a gospel. We love you for it. Thank you for the privilege ourselves, but for the privilege of helping others. And show us how we can be an instrument in your hand to bring that about in our families, in our homes, in our communities in such a way that the love of God would be manifest into our heart, that the captives would be set free, that the wounded would be bound up. What a privilege, Lord, to be part of that. Thank you. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen.